Before we start the discussion, I really want to um, take a moment to honor uh, the life and the teachings of Dr. Paul Farmer. Um, I tear up as I just think about, uh, about him. As you all know, he's a strong and uncompromising champion for dignity and health care for everyone, everywhere. Um, Paul wasn't afraid to clash with big institutions who were focused on cost effectiveness or moved too slowly. He was beloved by many. Uh, he's a friend, uh, husband, father, and he was most definitely beloved a lot uh, by a member of the school, com by the school community, who re whose work reinforced the need to give global healthcare access and equity its own spotlight at the forum. Now, I know each one of you are champions uh, yourself and you I feel like sometimes the best way to honor those who have passed on in life is to honor their legacy and what they have taught us about life and as I think about um, the conversation today each one of you have that legacy, continue that legacy with your commitment to equality and access to all health care so I want to start with the with a basic question actually which is um what started you off how how did you get here and i want to start with ala uh, can you start us off with a, a a brief description of what impacted your journey so far oh i'm happy to in short i'm the daughter of immigrants um and health you know medicine is is one of um a few avenues where they where they few avenues where they feel there is um security. But beyond that, my dad was actually a doctor. Um, and my dad left Libya, um, where my parents and I are originally from, um, in the early 1980s and moved to Canada. And I would often go, I have 10 brothers and sisters. Um, so I joke that my after school activity was to go to the hospital um, and to study in the library and, and to work there while my dad was working. And so I, I spent a lot of my formative years in a hospital. Um, and I would argue that it is, to me, um, you hear more prayers and, and whispered negotiations in the chapel room of a hospital than, than I've heard in mosques and synagogues and churches all over. To me, it is the single most spiritual place. It is where people um, truly show up for each other. Um, and so I've always had a strong belief, and I think the world now shares that in these past couple of years, that if people are healthy, people have the agency to do everything else. But to add to that quickly, just in respect with um, Dr. Farmer, I had always looked at medicine from a you know provider patient perspective. Um, and it wasn't until after I started my women's rights organization and I really started looking at how we can shift things on a more community level that I began to explore that even in medicine. And my thesis that I wrote in 2016 was on um, was on pandemic response um, in countries and, and how it, it and, and Dr. Paul Farmer's work, um, I think, was referenced more than anyone else's throughout it. And so he was a, a very pivotal actor in, in me beginning to shift my perception of how healthcare has been used historically um, in many countries and how we can use it differently now and how we can ensure that it's um, that it's provided for differently now uh, to really provide countries and people with those basic rights and dignities. That's beautiful. Thank you, Ala. Thank you. I want to go now to Joya, which first I want to give my personal condolences uh, at the passing of Dr. Farmer. And um, you worked with him. But before describing that relationship, I wonder what impacted you personally in your life to be a chief medical officer at Partners of Health. Yeah. Thank you, Zainab. Um, so, you know, I also am the daughter of an immigrant, not two. My mom uh, is uh, a Euro-American from Chicago, but my father immigrated uh, from India to the United States in the 1950s. I didn't understand very much about his home country, nor his home city of Calcutta, or the, the circumstances that made him want to leave. Um, and then at eight years old, uh, my family, I have just a brother and a sister, we traveled to Calcutta and it was 1972, which was the end of the war of independence between Bangladesh and Pakistan. 
And it was the largest refugee crisis in the 20th century. Uh, 10 million people were displaced and moving between um, West and East Bengal. Uh, and of course, Calcutta as the largest city in that region was home to many, many people fleeing um, the, the violence and the war. And in fact, India was under a national emergency, but my parents kind of took us anyway. And they, they weren't activists. My dad was an engineer and my mom was an English teacher. Um, they just took us there to see our family, my dad's many brothers and sisters and cousins we had never met. Um, but being born in the US and raised in suburban Long Island, uh, it was an absolute shock to me. And I think I was just at that age, children have a deep sense of social justice, I think. And it was just at that age where I could remember enough and see my own self in many of the children who were on the streets begging, many of the children who were laying across the laps of their mother asking for alms. My father's family lives right near the, the major temple in Calcutta. And so, so many people were congregated there begging. And many of them were very sick, uh, particularly with leprosy. And I was you know, moved by that and scared as an eight-year-old and asked my parents, you know, so how did that person get to look like that? And, you know, my mom, I remember saying, well, that person has leprosy. And I said, can I catch it? And she said, no, no, only poor people get leprosy. And I think that realization just sort of um, broke something in me about my suburban comfort that like, I had privilege and I didn't have a name for it at age eight, but I think for the rest of my life, I saw the world as very different. It was really hard to come back to the level of privilege and not remember those things in a kind of nightmarish sort of way. And I really, when I got to college, it was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And I think I understood that AIDS quickly was going to become like leprosy, like tuberculosis, that it would be a condition that would consign people to be othered. And I, we saw that in the United States with the gay community, but, but it was rapidly spreading throughout Africa. So I, when I went to medical school, I thought I'm going to be an AIDS doctor. And you know, no one wanted to be an AIDS doctor there because it was just like ministering to the dying. There was no treatment. This is in the early 90s, late 80s. And I stumbled upon a tiny organization called Partners in Health um, that was brave enough to treat a handful of patients in Haiti. Uh, and I said, I'll work for you for free. <laughs> that was 24 years ago. Um, but we started treating people not only with the drugs, but with food and housing and, and school fees for their children, understanding that AIDS was tracking along the lines of, you know, marginalization and, um, you know, and Paul's bravery and partners in health too, you know, many of my Haitian colleagues, particularly, they said, we're just going to do this. People aren't going to like it. You know, we were criticized by the academy, um, you know, told we were gold plated, not sustainable, all those things. Um, but luckily, in this case, they have about optimism, we we're talking about um, the world took notice and did the right thing. And, and I think it was pressure from civil society groups. It was people living with AIDS themselves. It was really amazing African leaders like uh, Dr. Gatahi. Um, so many people said, no, no, no. Uh, if they can do it in Haiti, we can do it over here. And we became part of a much larger movement that superseded the previous nihilism. And it's a story of the triumph of hope, you know, when we go out and do something we believe in at the beginning, it may be hard, but eventually it does thrive, you know, it does get hurt eventually. Uh, and with that, Dr. Kathani, I'm so interested in hearing your story and how you got uh, to where you are today. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I, I tend to consider myself a product of chance, actually. Uh, how so? I won the lottery 52 years ago, being born to a mother, a peasant mother, as her eighth child. But the lottery I won is that though she was illiterate, she gave birth to me and my siblings in the village in Kenya, about 200 kilometers out of Nairobi. 
without shoes, without electricity, no pipe to water, you know, on a small piece of land. She believed that feeding her children and taking them to school was the most important thing she could do. And that's the lottery I won because when I look back and I see the neighbors, the young children we went to school with who didn't win that lottery of having a mother who believed that nutrition and education was important for them, I left them way behind and uh, it still breaks my heart to know that it was so simple. It was nutrition and it was education. So that's the lottery I won 53 years ago that my mother bothered to breastfeed me for six months and uh, to take me to school again is all odds. And uh, then when I grew up and uh, because of that nutrition, I don't remember any special training. I just went on and I passed school, I passed exams and I landed in medical school. Uh, but when I landed in medical school is when I realized that actually that I met other people I hadn't met before because when I came to the capital city and I meet people who are from middle class and you know high income and I start to realize uh, that actually the opposite of poverty is not wealth because I wasn't there because we were wealthy. I realized that the opposite of poverty is justice. And what I had and what brought me to this platform was that my mother gave me justice. And justice was that she offered me the thing that I needed to build my human capital that others didn't get. They didn't get to build their human capital. And it wasn't, um, you know, justice could be denied uh, by commission, but it could also be, you know, denied by omission, uh, where the people who are taking care of our communities are not aware and they don't have the means and they're living under what we call structural violence. And that is the what it brings to this platform, building That's human that. capital through justice, through equity. It's so inspiring that all of you, I mean, you're talking about the opposite of poverty as justice. A lot talks about higher power in, in the hospital rooms. Uh, Julia talk about the triumph of hope. It's so beautiful, even though in, you are all in these powerful positions that we need to go back to this essential quality in human lives. Um, and with that, I want to, you know, go into the institutional now, you know, uh, and I want to start with Ala. Um, in both your capacity uh, with the UN as well as with the Gates Foundation, what do you what does the global community need to do differently now in your opinion um especially as we're still struggling through this pandemic um i actually think it's listening to local communities um that is something that we don't do well enough uh, in global health um oftentimes we determine what is the biggest challenge for a population and then we determine how we're going to fix it um and we go and we consult with the local community um and i think we really need to do this differently because the people that are most impacted, the people that are closest to the challenge, the people that live through this every day, those local leaders are the ones who have to actually implement in those moments of conflict, in those moments of inequality, in those moments of crisis. Um, and very frankly, they're the ones who have credibility with the local community. Um, they're the ones who have that inherent buy-in and they're the ones who can bring those issues to light. And so I, I really think it is, it is putting the local first um, and and it's interesting because it, it took a global pandemic for us to realize that we are we are collectively as strong as the weakest you know healthcare link um and so we be, we need to be able to build resilient healthcare systems around the world and the only people who can do that are the people who live there work there um and and are going to be the ones who implement that in the long term thank you thank you ala i want to take it back to uh julia you know, where have we failed, you know, and what kind of leadership is needed at times in times of crisis like the one we are dealing with right now? What, you know, what can we do to do it differently in the future? Yeah, I, you know, I loved what um, Gitanji said about justice. And I think where we failed is that we don't understand that in inequities um, mirror our injustice. And health is just a thermometer for that injustice. You know, health is, you know, if you look at the life expectancy in my hometown of Boston, if you take the subway from Roxbury Crossing to Back Bay, the life expectancy drops about 30 years. <clears throat> That's not genetic. That's not biological. That is about the legacy of racism, um, of all of the... In, the things that come along with that, housing, job security, schooling, et cetera. And so the way to really decrease that 30-year gap 
is by resourcing for equity, right? And so to me, where we've, where we failed is we don't look, we look at inequity as somehow behavioral. Well, you know, people that you, you find loads of these pro, uh, programs in behavioral health, like teach people to, you know, you know, exercise and eat better food. And, but that's not the, that is not the root cause. So I think we have we as elites have been lulled into this idea that we're healthy and wealthy because we're smarter, because we make better choices. And that's not the case. The data does not bear that out. That is not evidence-based. And so I think one of the most important lessons to me in health equity is to achieve health equity, we have to put the resources in to deal with the inequities. Again, whether it's food, housing, uh, whether it's school, th these things are going to improve health. And of course, people need health care. But if you don't address those what are called social determinants of health, which to me are social, economic and political forces, they're not determinants. They have a direction and a magnitude, right? They're vectors. Mm -hmm. So if we don't push back on those directions and magnitudes um, of oppression, we cannot have health equity. Those social determinants actually make up the bulk of our healthcare um, reality, and so people's health is not defined by brick and mortar hospitals. Or um, that's actually makes up ten to twenty percent. The bulk of it is is based on those those social determinants and those um, you know political, social, economic forces. So completely agree that that's where we need to start. Thank you, Dr. Kathenji. You know, I want to come back to you about the international. Uh, to, in the international development system, you know, and how has it has traditionally been fairly utilitarian, you know, do the most good for the most people at the lowest cost. How might a focus on equity shift how we think about healthcare and delivery? This is really the crux of the matter. And uh, I think this is what uh, both uh, Jaya and uh, Allah are talking about that fast health is made where the people are, that's where health is made. It's not made in the hospital. The hospitals are the places we repair when things go wrong. And I think when I remember Paul Farmer, uh, Jaya, we share the laws because I think Paul is one person who understood this concept very well, that uh, yes. health yes. is made where yes. people are. And um, the, the one thing I want to reflect on international delivery system, and I say something probably a bit controversial, is that I value uh, the data that is most valuable to me is lived experiences. It's not peer-reviewed published data. Amen. And Amen. That, and that, yes, and that is what international health system follows. As long as it's published in the Harvard uh, Review, then that's what we are going to do. And when the local organizations are actually programming for health, they are told, give us references. Where was it published? Include references. Can I reference my mother who breastfed me for six months, brought up nine children, they're all alive and they're healthy? I can't reference her because she's not published. So the question is, equity will depend on us actually serving the people who actually understand and the people that actually need the services that we are trying to deliver. And that uh, will not fit into that mechanism of uh, just, you know, give the most people the most good at the lowest cost because yeah. then... The context is different, you know. The context of providing antenatal care to a woman who lives in an extremely paternalistic society where her husband needs to give permission to go for antenatal care will be very different from where you're dealing with an urban center or, you know, where the, the woman is, you know, the health center is next door. The woman in Ethiopia, in Afar or Somalia or in, um, you know, in a rural village of Malawi or called, uh, you know, Mzuzu, will need to travel for and probably sleep on the way to find antenatal care. So we need to look at this. We need to actually contextualize. And we can only contextualize if we are closest to this problem we are trying to solve. Because you know what? The communities have the solution. We are almost out of time. So I want to uh, close it with asking you all one question, which is, this work is, you're obviously very passionate about the work. You put your, all your life and dedicate your life uh, for that. And yet I know it is very hard and it can take a toll on you sometimes as you have to negotiate and compromise and deal with the injustices and the equality of it all. So my 
basic question, and if we can just do a quick answer for each, um, what gives you hope? Well, I think it's two things. Um, it is it is others in this space, like the you know, like this panel, um, that are honestly talking about the same things and saying we need to do things differently, um, and we really need to spotlight and focus on um, local leadership and, and work with community. Um, and as you were talking about your mother, I was thinking about my grandma. Um, my grandma was the same. She was illiterate. Um, she got married very young. Um, she had my dad. And she ended up passing away before her 25th birthday because she had um, an undiagnosed condition and she didn't have access to care. And um, and there are millions, millions of people who face that today around the world. Um, and I, I do think about, um, my dad would also say he was, he lived a, a lucky life um, and, and he's had a lot of opportunities and a lot of chances that others didn't have, but it does make me wonder if we were really able to deliver to communities and to ensure that all people had access to care, uh, how many more uh, people would there be who get to go on to become vice chancellors and head of heads of medical agencies? And I mean, what? How much are we missing out on? Um, and and I think that's that's something that keeps me going. Thank you, thank you, Julia. Mine is very short. It's the growing movement of people who care. It's just that growing movement. It's beautiful. And Dr. Kathinchi, the last word is to you. Wow, that, that's it. it, it that, that's it. It's that change is possible. Change is possible because we are testimonies that change is possible. And I think if we are testimonies that change is possible, then why should we give up? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, beautiful. I have to say that I leave the session inspired and with a stronger heart than I would say that I started it and uplifted and knowing that there are people like you um, who keep the fight going, who keep it going and, and you're carrying it with, the, you're carrying the message uh, with so much love and so much care and so much kindness and compassion. And so I thank you for that. And I hope, I'm sure everyone will be as inspired by you as I have. Thank you and hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.